Um, it really is kind of fun to be here this morning, to be on this side of Rob's perch. Usually I'm at a table and just soaking it all in. And um, as he said, I'm kind of a reluctant speaker. He has been asking me for quite a long time, but God just opened up the door. And so I pray that he blesses this time and that what I speak accurately represents his heart and maybe just gives you something new or fresh to think about regarding the um, topic of prophecy and uh, prophetic spiritual gifting. So as he mentioned, the ministry started here at the church about six or seven years ago. Ken and Diana Ladley um, brought it here, and there was about a year period, I believe, where they worked with Rob and um, Randy and Darla to make sure that the ministry perfectly aligned with the vision and the core values of the Cowboy Church. I've been active in the ministry for about five years, and I've been leading it for about a year and a half, and I really feel like we've... Uh, perfected it. Well, it's not perfect, but it's refined and it's fine-tuned, and I feel really good about the way we do the prophetic ministry here. Um, it just seems to be a tremendous blessing for everyone that's involved. I am not an expert, and I know that some of you here have decades of experience in exercising your prophetic gifting. So I'm actually really looking forward to hearing your comments at the end um, when we kind of go through the table questions. Uh, I think you all are going to have some wonderful things to share. So this is a very big topic, and we have a very little amount of time, so I'm going to dive right in. I thought that we would begin with the difference between prophecy and prophetic gifting. So prophecy is a fairly common topic uh, shared within churches and the faith community. And from Genesis to Revelation, we're fairly familiar with prophecy as it relates to Jesus, his birth, his death, his resurrection, and of course, Revelation and the pro prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled. But interestingly, many of God's recorded statements in Genesis are actually prophecy. I'm doing a study of Genesis this year, and it just jumped out at me as I'm reading the things that, that God spoke to um, Adam and Eve, to Cain, to Abram, to Sarai, to Hagar, regarding Ishmael, to Rebekah, and they are prophecy. I thought, wow, and of course, I mean, that's how God would speak. He only speaks truth. He knows the beginning and the end. It's, it's his. It's his time. And so it just sort of put a different... Um, aspect to my reading scripture in Genesis. Um, so we know that God does speak prophetically. He always has, and he has spoken prophetically to his people in scripture, and he continues to do so today. In addition to God's prophetic words, we can also add the prophecies that he has given to the major and the minor prophets, as well as to others whom God gave words to speak at a particular time for a specific reason in a particular circumstance. So it did occur to me that the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is actually a, a prophetic book from start to finish. And that changes my frame of reference a bit regarding prophecy in the Bible because the Bible is actually the record of prophecy and of God's plan for us. By contrast, prophetic giftedness is not really taught much in churches today. It's just kind of ignored. And it may be one of the least taught subjects um, in a lot of churches. And that's really a shame because when there's no instruction regarding the biblical foundation for prophetic giftedness, many people often think that prophecy is a little spooky or weird or that it's just not um, a it's not reliable, and yet it is recorded in Scripture as a real gift that is meant to be used and encouraged. So why the shunning by mainstream denominations? I don't know. I don't have the answer to, for that. Um, I'll leave that to others to debate and decide, but I'm just thankful that the Assemblies of God fully embraces prophetic giftedness and that they recognize that it is um, a spirit-led occurrence and that they have introduced it here at the Cowboy Church and that we have um, really seen God do some amazing things through this ministry. So what is a prophetic statement today? 
Well, it is a word that is spoken, dreamt, or seen in a vision, which conveys a message from God for the benefit of his people. It also conveys God's heart for his people. Revelation 19.10 says, Worship God, for it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. In other words, because of who Jesus is, because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit at salvation, because of the spiritual gifts that we are given, we have the ability to speak prophetically as the Spirit directs and as God desires in accordance to his will and for his purposes. So how is the gift of prophecy defined or described in scripture? Well, the spiritual gift of prophecy is principally described in three ways, and you've probably heard this um, before. I know Rob has taught about this fairly extensively um, in a few years back in, in Digging Deep. So in Romans 12, 6 or 8, we see what are called the motivational gifts, and these are given at the point of salvation. These are the lens through which we see people, circumstances, and service. Quote, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. So the motivational gifts are prophecy, service, teaching, encouragement or exhortation, giving, leading, and mercy. And these shape our view of life, people, and service. In 1 Corinthians 12, we see what are commonly called the manifestations of the spirit in spiritual gifts given for the good of God's people. There, quote, there are different kinds of gifts but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit to another gifts of healing by that one spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. So the manifestation gifts are wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, power, and prophecy, and they are given in a particular situation to bring glory to God and for the benefit of his people as the spirit determines. And the third description of gifts is found in Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, and it is referred to as the governmental or ministry gifts. Quote, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So the ministry gifts are apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, and these are the tools that God uses to build his church. So just to recap to this point, the Bible is a prophetic book from cover to cover. Hundreds of prophecies are recorded either from God himself or his called prophets or others chosen to deliver a specific word from him at a specific time to a specific group. And the spiritual gifts of prophecy as, are described in three ways as the manifestation gift given at salvation, a motivational gift given when needed, or a ministry gift given to build up the church. So a question that tugged me, for, tugged at me for so many years is, what do you do with a prophetic gifting? And how do you serve God and others today with a prophetic gift? Essentially, one can be a lone ranger and go it alone, or one can serve on a team if a church is blessed to have a prophetic ministry, which we do here. And one size does not fit all with prophetic ministries. There are many ways to design a program depending on what you want to do with it, 
However, I do believe that there are ways to structure a prophetic ministry so that it is not abused or twisted, which might result in team members receiving the glory instead of God receiving the glory that he deserves. Now, who can prophesy? Well, the short answer is anyone. All you have to do is ask. Some people do have the inherent ability to receive prophetic words or warnings, but anyone who earnestly desires and asks for this ability will be given it. 1 Corinthians 14.31, for, for you all can prophesy in turn so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. Verse 39, therefore, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. It is also a developed gift. So even those who have this gift inherently must work to develop and expand and refine it. In the prophetic ministry, we are always asking God to speak through us in a fresh way. We want to grow so that we can better serve those who come through the ministry. We ask God to give us new ways of sharing his heart with those who come to hear from him. We never want to remain stale or complacent. We want to be as dynamic as the God that we serve. And we are prophetic people. We are not prophets. This is a very important distinction. And if someone calls themselves a modern-day prophet, please... Be very, very discerning when that person speaks. Confirm in your spirit that what they are saying is from the Lord and no one else and nowhere else. Another way to think of this is that prophetic people speak a word from God. Biblical prophets spoke a word for God. So again, be very, very wary of people today who call themselves modern-day prophets. Use great discernment when listening to what they are saying. Ask the Spirit to give you wisdom. And I will just point out, YouTube is full of these videos. You can find them, so just really pray before you start listening. And, and if the Spirit, you know, sort of gives you a little nudge in the side that maybe this isn't something you should be spending your time on, just turn away. Because there are false prophets out there. Even when studying the major and the minor prophets, which everyone should do because that is a deep and rich study, please remember to give all honor to the Lord of the prophets and not to the prophets of the Lord. Likewise, people who speak prophetically must always be on guard and remain very, very humble because there can be a great temptation to thinking that they are all that and a bag of chips. Pride is deceptive, it is destructive, and it can spoil a ministry from within so quickly. We must uh, serve with humility, showing grace, toward other team members and always remain teachable as God matures and refines us. It is a grave responsibility when one says that they are representing the heart of God and are delivering a word from him. This gift should be regarded with awe and reverence. We are telling people that we are sharing a word from God's heart and this is no small thing. And one last cautionary thought. The enemies of God do not want prophetic people to be fruitful. The word of God is alive and active. It is sharper than a two-edged sword, and it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit. Hebrews 4.12. Those who are called into a prophetic ministry will often experience opposition in the form of spiritual warfare. It may be in the form of discouragement, insecurity, health, confusion, finances, or any other type of attack that can distract from hearing clearly and sharing confidently. We must never let our guard down or we will cease to be effective in the, God, in the job that God has called us to do. 
So why do people receive prophetic words, warnings, or messages? Well, most simply, for the benefit of God's people. A word from the Lord can give comfort, strengthen, and encourage a person. The mission statement of our prophetic ministry is from 1 Corinthians 14.3, which says, But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, comfort, and encouragement. As you probably know, the mission statement here at the church is to reach, teach, and disciple. So the mission statement of the prophetic ministry is to strengthen, encourage, and comfort. And it aligns very nicely with the vision of the Cowboy Church to reach, teach, and disciple, to strengthen, encourage, and comfort. It's good. Sometimes a prophetic word will warn or prepare people for what is yet to come. God will prepare his people either for service or for something else that may be coming their way. He does not want us to be caught off guard, but rather to be ever vigilant. Some churches use prophetic people to facilitate the breaking of strongholds. There are specific ministries uh, that are dedicated to helping hurting people or those in bondage to a stronghold to break free from those curses and bonds. These can be called freedom or deliverance ministries. Um, um, sorry, I've lost my train of thought there. <laughs> Too many thoughts going through my head. Um, and these tend to be very bold ministries, and they do have prophetic people as their foundational servants, but they have to be bold because we, God uses these prophetic people um, to guide people out of a very dark place of oppression and into the light of God's love, redemption, and restoration. So... It, a freedom or deliverance ministry is very different from what we do in our ministry. However, we have had people come through who needed to be led through the breaking of a, of a bondage. And we are prepared to do that if, if that um, occurs on our ministry night. But no matter what type of ministry it might be, an orderly and healthy prophetic ministry within a church should encourage belief within the church as God speaks in a fresh way to people who wouldn't otherwise hear his word of hope, love, encouragement, and deliverance. As scripture says, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the congregations of the Lord's people. I am really thankful that our prophetic ministry began with a good structure and format. It is personal and intimate. It is purposeful and intentional. It is thoughtful and planned, all of which are attributes of God and attributes of the God that we serve. The ministry here is not public. No one is put on a stage or put on the spot. It simply ministers to people one-on-one -on -one so that God always receives the honor that he is due and so that the people he loves so dearly can hear his voice and his heart in a very safe way. We actually refer to ministry nights as spiritual spa nights. A lot of times when we're done with our ministry, nobody wants to leave the room. We invite the Holy Spirit to come be with us, and he is. And it's just an incredible experience. And we all just kind of sit there and say, do we, do we really have to leave? Well, a 7 o'clock appointment has to leave because the 7.30 appointment wants to come in. <laughs> but sometimes the 7.30 person, it's hard to, it's hard to say, we need to, we need to leave. Now they're going to lock up the church. <laughs> So when does God speak to prophetic people, and how does God give a prophetic word? Well, anytime. Sometimes in dreams, sometimes when you're sitting in the car, sometimes just out of the blue. There is no rhyme or reason. God speaks when he chooses to speak. Often we will receive a message through prayer when we are asking for a word for a particular person. But one size does not fit all when receiving a prophetic message. Some people dream dreams. 
Some people have visions. And a vision is not like what you think of, like how Hollywood would depict it. It's not all gauzy and you're in a trance. It's really just a, a picture, like a photograph or a, a picture in a magazine. It's just an image that you have. Or it could be like a, just a little snippet from a movie. Um, so, I, you know, hopefully that dispels a few misconceptions of when you hear visions. Some people get Bible stories, some people get scripture, some people get uh, almost like a, like a word, like a letter. Um, and, and some people, they get the word first, then scripture. Some people get scripture first and then the word. It is always different. God is not static or limited. And so the way he gives his word is as unique as the people to whom he gives the word. Now sometimes he'll just drop a word into your spirit and then you have to use discernment to know if and when to give that word to the person that it is for. It may be that the person is not yet ready to hear it. And that has happened to me before. He's given me a word and I say, okay, Lord, if you want me to share this, when? And sometimes he's had me wait a week. Sometimes he's had me wait six months. It, it is... I never know quite why he would give a word that far in advance, but it has happened, and it does happen. So it's not just receiving the word, it's discernment about how to give it and when to give it. Only God knows why he gives it before it should be shared, but it does happen. And one characteristic of a prophetic person is that when God gives a word, they are compelled to share it. So it takes a lot of discipline to rein that in sometimes and to wait on the Lord's prompting. However, if a word is not shared in absolute love, it may be rejected outright. And this is a lesson that we all have to learn, and most of us have learned it the hard way. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I have nothing. 1 Corinthians 13.2 So how do we do the prophetic ministry here at the church? We meet on Monday nights. We have two appointments, one at 7, one at 7.30. If you um, feel pulled to come experience our prophetic ministry. You need to call Rob's administrative assistant, Sarah Bootland. She keeps our calendar, and she will put you on the schedule when there's an opening. She keeps that confidential. Team members never know who's coming. All we are told is that we have two men, two women, a man, a woman, a woman, a man. That's all we're told is gender. And we have about five days in advance to pray or to receive whatever word God gives us. Whatever it is, however it comes, we record it. We write it down. We do not talk to each other. We have, usually have a team of four. We don't talk to each other in advance. We don't compare notes. What did you get? I don't, you know, we, we don't do that. We just trust that what he gives us is good. Well, usually he tells us because we sort of say, Lord, did I hear right? And he goes, it's good. It's good. Trust me, it's good. Okay. And we take it on Mondays, and we have a pre-meeting, and we will share with each other what we have gotten to make sure that there is agreement, and also to determine the order that we're going to give the word to our person. And then when they come in, we just read the word to them. Now, we don't ever receive anything dark. He doesn't share mysteries. He doesn't tell us secret things. We don't understand even what the word is because it's not for us. We really are just a conduit. We like to say it's God's heart to our heart to their heart. Um, Diana Ladley actually had that inspiration, and it just, we, we love it, and it so perfectly represents what the ministry is. We are simply a conduit from God's heart to um, our, our person's heart. And we, we, don't, uh, we don't tell them what to do, we don't counsel, we don't give advice, we just simply give them what the Lord has, uh, has for them. We ask God, what is it that you want this person to know? What do you want them to hear from you today? And one thing I like about this, a few years ago, someone said, well, why do I need to come through the prophetic ministry? Because if I pray and I ask God to speak to me, won't he answer my question or won't he reveal something to me? 
And that is true, and he absolutely will. What's different about what we do is because we are praying for strangers, we have no filter. We don't have God in a box. We don't have any expectation of what we want to hear or hope to hear or need to hear. So when we ask, we're basically, we have a blank canvas. And so the Lord can speak absolutely anything that he wants that person to know regardless of what they think they want to know. And it's really quite remarkable. Um, we have had people that come in and they kind of have a particular question or burden that they're hoping to get an answer for. Sometimes God gives that, sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he gives it in a way that is uh, not exactly how they thought they were going to get the answer they were hoping for. But it's, um, it's just amazing to see how God works. First Thessalonians 5, 19 through 21 says, Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecy with contempt, but test everything and hold on to the good. We encourage everyone to take the words that they have been given and to test them. Test them in prayer. Test them against scripture. Test them in their spirit and hold on to what's good. It may be that they receive a word for something that's coming that they haven't uh, yet experienced. God is preparing them. And we, in, we uh, invite people, we ask them to return to those words from time to time. I had somebody tell me that it was a year later. She says, Lord, I know it's coming. I know it's coming. And it was a year. And then when it happened, she goes, there it is. There it is. I, I knew. Because we have four people on our team, we do have confirmation against each other, which won't necessarily happen if um, you get sort of the Lone Ranger type of prophecy. But that does happen, and I've been given words for someone, and I just really have to trust that the Lord has given me something that is accurate and true, and that he will take those words and he will use them, um, that the, the person that they're for will confirm, will take the time and, and the effort to confirm them on their end. In closing, I just want to say that this is a very rich topic, and I have only scratched the surface. And it really is a shame that mainstream churches today act as if prophetic gifting doesn't even exist, because it absolutely does. And it is a tremendous blessing, not only to those who receive their word from God, but also those who are called to deliver the word. And those of us who are called to serve on the team can't believe from week to week that we get to do this, that we are allowed to see and entrusted with a glimpse of God's heart for his people. It's really almost indescribable. So thank you again for letting me share today. And I'd be happy to answer any questions if I'm able to. And of course, as you know, we love applications here at Digging Deep. And so I've come up with a few applications for you to consider. And then I was thinking that these would actually make really good um, discussion questions at our table for a few minutes after. So I think what we'll do is we'll have a Q&A time right now, and then we'll maybe do the table, uh, the table questions um, in a small group. So the applications that I came up with, and of course, if you have one of your own, by all means, um, take that. So ask God to give you the ability to hear prophetically if you don't know that you do. Or if you do, ask God to further develop the gift. Or if you are uncertain, ask God to confirm that you do hear prophetically. Or if this is all brand new, ask God to show you how to study further and to remove the mystery and the misconceptions. And the last one is, you could ask God to give you wisdom and discernment when you encounter a prophetic person or a prophetic message. And just ask for that wisdom. Don't be afraid. Just be discerning. So that's it. I think oh, one last thing I did want to share with you for anybody who does want um, maybe to study a little bit further. Ken Ladley, and Ken and Diana brought the ministry to the, ch to the church. I think I mentioned that. And Ken gave me this reference. Uh, it's 
called Growing in the Prophetic. It's by Mike Bickle, who is the director of the International House of Prayer in Kansas City. This is a fantastic book. It's a very easy read. It's uh, solid information. And I think if you want an additional study into it, this might um, just flesh out a lot more about how a prophetic uh, spiritual gift can, can and should be used to glorify God and to build up his body. So thank you all. So what question do you have? Is there something you want her to clarify or to explain better about how it actually happens here? Let's ask our questions to her and then we'll do discussion in tables where you can discuss. So kind of keep it to maybe a clarification or how it works here because you may have heard this for the first time and you don't truly understand how it works on Monday nights when there's a prayer appointment. So ask a question. I'm sure somebody else might be having the same question. Yeah. You went through it? Okay, good. Good. Thank you. Um, Regarding visions, or um, there was a there was a prophetic meeting that we had several years ago, and I will say, the Holy Spirit sort of wipes us clean after we speak the word and give it to the person. He kind of just scrubs us clean, so that for the next person, we're a blank slate. But every now and then, there's a, a little thing here or there that we might recall. So there was one time where one of the ladies on the team. She said, I don't understand this, but I saw a willow tree by a pond. I don't know what that is, what that means, but I just saw this, and it was during the time that I was receiving the word for you, so I just want to share it with you. And it was a gentleman, and he said, I can't believe this. I begin and end my day. He lives on property, and there is a willow tree by a pond. And he says, I begin and end my day in prayer, time with the Lord, under that tree. So, did that, Im did that vision, did that image tell him anything? Only that God knows him and hears him. And it was confirmation for the rest of what he got. Because if God knew him so intimately that he gave that little picture to that woman for that night, then how powerful was the rest of what he received? Yeah, thanks for asking that. That's great. I love that. Yes. What else? Yeah, right. It's not a no, we, d we don't. We don't. So it's just a, it's a, the 30 minute appointment. And once people come and they receive, then they just go. And like I said, <laughs> like I said, God does wipe us clean. There have been times where people have been through two or even three times. It, it's not one and done. People can come back again if they feel led to. And I think one time this young lady was in there and I, I was you know, said, have you been through the prophetic ministry before? She says, yes, this is my third time, and you've been my leader both times. <laughs> she goes, so it really is true that you don't remember <laughs> when people come through. <laughs> and we don't follow up. And uh, unless there is a particular area of need that becomes very apparent, and then we just uh, pass the word along to church leadership. And that, that, that's beyond what we do. And so we just let other, pe other people in the church that are, are trained and ordained to take care of those types of things. But that rarely happens. Yes, yes Riley. Thank you. That's a good question. I think everyone heard what he was asking. What is the process of discernment uh, when trying to determine if something uh, 
that we receive for someone is accurate and from the Lord. For me, it's a, a matter of trying to empty my own thoughts and just be a vessel for the spirit to nudge um, or confirm. There will be maybe Nelda and Virgie could, or Lori could add to this. It's a sense of peace that that what is um, that what is being shared is is good and is accurate. When I mean, it is possible to have a little kind of spiritual prickly feeling that something's not right and then you just don't share it don't share it did that answer your question It does make sense. So uh, I, I think that's really an issue of uh, spiritual maturity and relying upon the Lord and the Holy Spirit. So I, I hear what you're saying about that being an element of faith, but I think it's also part of the learning process. So as we said, discernment is a developed gift. And in the beginning, it can be quite raw. So for decades, really, I knew things and I didn't understand why I knew things. I just knew it. And my poor dear husband would say, well, how do you know that? And I'm like, I don't know. I just know it. And I, because I was always in a mainstream church that just acted as if spiritual pro uh, prophecy didn't exist. In fact, I had an associate pastor at one church. I specifically asked him, what do I do with this? Why does this keep coming up on my spiritual gift surveys? And he says, oh, that's really not for today. Don't, don't even be worried about that. Just let's concentrate on these other aspects in your, in your gifting survey. And I thought, this just doesn't make sense. Because first of all, you're testing for it. Secondly, it's in scripture. So why are you denying it? And that's why I'm just so incredibly thankful. As soon as I was invited, Rob invited me to attend the training for the prophetic ministry here. And I had a lot of things on my plate, and I really didn't want to do it. But I knew from the first time I went that I was going to end up being part of the ministry. I knew God was calling me to it. And it is such a joy to know that there is such fulfillment when you step into what God has gifted you to do. And that is really kind of the neatest thing of all. So I don't know that I really have a solid answer for you. For, for me, the process is just that I try to empty myself and just trust from now the years, the few years of experience where I have trusted that, that what the Spirit was prompting me was accurate. Now I, I trust myself. I know this is good, this is not. I should, I should go with this. I should be afraid of, not afraid, but I should be wary of that. And, and you know what his voice sounds like. I do. So, I, <clears throat> excuse me. It's his, it's his voice because you've learned to hear it, right? So, that, that's true. Yeah. That is true.
That, that's very good, Nelda. And, and in fact, I'm glad you mentioned that because I know there was, we do try, we sometimes, we sometimes don't do this, but we do try within our group because we come prepared with the written word. We've already prepared in advance what God has given us. So we're not doing on the spot prophecy. Um, but there are times where we are in our meeting and the Lord will give us something right then. Um, it, it doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen. What we always used to do um, was confirm that with the person next to us, as two or three will confirm, and not give it to the person unless it's confirmed with the person next to us. There was a time recently where somebody received something, it was a, a little, actually a, a picture of something, and she didn't confirm it. And before I knew it was happening, she shared it, and. I knew there was there was a, a, a hitch in my giddy up. I mean, I, I was like, oh, oh, I wish that hadn't happened, but I couldn't pull it back. I thought, well, Lord, you're just going to have to handle this. I mean, it wasn't any, it was just a little picture of something, wasn't, didn't, but I could tell it didn't mean anything to the woman. About a month later, I realized that, that that picture was actually for the woman who received it, not the woman that she gave it to. So it is very important, as you said, that we confirm um, things because we, we might not immediately feel that it's discerned that it's not good to give at that time or at all, but someone else on the team may. That's good. Yeah. So the team shows up with, with scriptures and with a word written out on a piece of paper, and they meet from 6.30 to 7 before that first person, and they share it with each other to confirm it. So they don't talk in advance, but they talk right before they share it and get confirmation. And then in the moment, if there's a word, they try to confirm it with each other uh, before they give it. So they share those words that they've given to them without really hearing. It's not a counseling session. It's not anything else. It's just like walking up to somebody and having them pray over you at the prayer altar in a sense, except that they have worked in advance. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's kind of like they just you just come in, they just... Um, share with you a little bit about how the process works so that you make sure that they understand it. And then they share the word with them, and then they pray over them before they leave. So it's kind of just a prayer session, and all you need to do when you come to the, prayer, to the appointment, all you need to do is just receive. Don't try to respond or, you know, whatever else. Just receive, and then like she said, take the word with you, and you have them written out on four pieces of paper from the people that uh, wrote them down. Take them with you and take it before the Lord. So it's good to, when you have an appointment to not have anything right away after when you leave. You know what I mean? You need to go sit before the Lord for a little, for a little while and really reflect on what was all just said. And do you still ask them to record it on their phone or... And you can record it on your own phone, you know, and put it down, put your phone down there and record it. And then you could even listen to the words that were shared so that you have it audio as well as the written thing that's been shared with you. So you should just try it, sign up for one and see what a blessing it is and go through the experience of it and, uh, and test it. I think it's a wonderful gift. It, it, it really is just to strengthen and to encourage and to comfort. It's not a freedom ministry or whatever else. If something happens that they need to kind of deal with in the moment, they can do that, but it's not really the designed, designed to do that. And they're not going to see something weird or whatever else. You know what I mean? I've got two hands. I don't know who was first. Steve, I think you were, we'll go to Steve and then to Don. How about that? Oh, you didn't have your hand raised? Was there somebody else right in here that I just, maybe it was, Okay. Yes. That's so confirming. Yes. Or at least complimentary, right? Yeah. In, in fact, I was going to mention, there was one night where I received a baking reference, and another woman on the team received an almost identical baking reference reference and when we shared our words and we realized we both had that we just sort of laughed and said well we hope that the person who's coming is a cook <laughs> and it turns out that 
they're a baker and that specifically spoke to them I've never gotten anything about cooking or baking before or since and and it just we just go isn't that like God isn't that just the way he works he makes it so personal that there's no question that this is specifically for this person Don right right well, it is for the last several years, but not originally, no, not at all. I grew up a Southern Baptist, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, my journey, first time I experienced this was I went to a prayer room in Kansas City. They actually, the guy that uh, wrote this book, years ago when I was working in another church in Katy, and we would go up there and uh, sit in the prayer room and worship and receive, and they had uh, prophetic prayer rooms, and so I went through the prophetic prayer room, and they had a trained team there, and you went and sat, and, um, and they, they were giving it uh, instantly, you know, in the moment, but it's so... Uh, it was so confirmed in my spirit when it when it happened, you know. And this this was years ago, and they gave you a cassette tape of <laughs> of what you heard, and um, so that just really opened me up to be ready to receive it. And I have been in some churches that were open to things of the spirit, and open to healing, and open to um, praying in a prayer language, and some of those kind of things. So it's been a progressive journey along the way to being open to, and even in my church growing up, we were kind of a Baptocostal, you know, kind of a, it had a little bit of Pentecostalness to it, not, not a typical mainline denomination. So I've been somewhat open to it all along, but it is a process of that, and if you want to talk more about it, I could sit down and maybe do a better job of explaining or we could deal with maybe specific questions that you have about it but I'd encourage you to come experience it once and that will probably help just answer a lot of things because you'll just experience it and then we could even talk some more or you could even come to the training that we do on it and experience it anybody that goes through we have like a training and then if there if someone's new Lori's probably the newest person on it but she came through the training but then she sat in as a team member for a little while and she would have to share the word anybody does I'm picking on Lori but you know whoever's new they have to share their word in that 30 minutes before while the team's meeting and you they kind of get to practice that and they may not share their word for several weeks they only share it with the team and then as they get more comfortable with receiving a word and sharing it then they're able to uh, actually share it with the person coming for prayer so it's a, like you said, Pastor Randy and Pastor Jarrell really oversaw this, and I went to every meeting for the first year that happened, and uh, we just did a lot of uh, refining of how we do it, and then now, NASA runs it all, and we meet like every other month or something like that, and we just kind of have a, uh, so she has a covering from that, and then I have a uh, covering over me that I report to, so it's, Hopefully we're keeping it all within balance and order and all of that. So, but I just love that we get to operate in this. It's just meant to encourage you and build you up. And, and, and like she said, it's so encouraging to those who get to do it and hear it and receive it because they're just getting to have God flow through them. So what a blessing for them at the same time. Yes. Okay, great. Okay, yes. Yes. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And so I grew up, this was, this was normal. But he said, now there's a guy who's not lost. And so I went and each time it was very interesting. That's good. What else? They have still have a thought or something to share? Yeah.
someone, then it does, like you said, fall away. So even the person receiving it is only going to take what's meaningful to them. Mm. And then because it's all scripture, it can never be wrong. Right. You know, I, I feel like, you know, anyone receiving scripture is receiving a prayer and it's all inspired by God. Yes. I can't tell you how many times we've got, we've given scripture to someone and they just look at us and say, that's my, that's my theme scripture that's on my refrigerator. Or they will say, my best friend called me this morning and gave me that scripture from her devotional. I, it just, and we already had it written down days in advance. It's, it, it's just God. It's just God. So anyway, I had, a verse that came, I had a verse that came to me while I was sitting back there. And it's a verse you may have heard before that says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. But if you look at the, uh, the original word in that verse, it says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. The word for word is rhema in the Greek. And rhema means a fresh word, a spoken word of the word, a prophetic word like we're talking about now. If the Bible wanted to say the word of God, it would use the word logos. Logos is the written word of God. Rhema word of God is a spoken, fresh, prophetic word of God. So if faith comes by hearing and hearing by the prophetic, spoken, encouraging word of God, then we can increase our faith by going through this and getting a fresh rhema word of God in your life. So if you're feeling like you need more faith and you want to grow in your faith, we had Faith Like Iron as our man camp theme this weekend, you know. And uh, so faith, and we can pray to increase our faith, but one of the ways that really happens as the body of Christ ministers that is by getting a rhema word of God through the church. So... And you did a great job of, in, in all of it, but a great job of talking about the three different places that we teach where the spiritual gifts are. And in all three of those places, the body of Christ is mentioned in the context. So it just all fits together that there's just something that can happen when you let the body of Christ minister to you. Because you can get a rhema word of God on your own in your own quiet time, right? But you also need to, from time to time, get a rhema word of God from someone in your life group or somebody in your Bible study or somebody here through this ministry. It's just another way for you to receive that. And it doesn't have to be you going through crisis and you need to get a rhema word of God. <laughs> it can be just you going through life and you get it because you're starting a new season or just for whatever reason. It, you don't have to have a specific reason to sign up and go through this. It's kind of just availability on the calendar and we just trust and put you down, so put, put you on the schedule. Anything else? Wow, we discussed it longer than I thought, but. Oh, four, is that 412? I might not have it in my written notes, but I'm pretty sure. Hebrews 4.12. Mm -hmm. For the word of God is a two-edged sword. Mm -hmm. Yes, That's so good. I agree with that. And one thing that Randy and 
Darla, Pastor Randy, and Pastor Darla don't want us to do is to just walk up to somebody and share a word with them, just with them not asking for it and whatever else. So if you're sitting in church and there's somebody two rows in front of you and you feel like God gives you a prophetic word for them, don't walk up and share it with them. You know, you need to go share it maybe with a pastor and let that pastor, you know, maybe that pastor knows what that person's going through. I have had that happen. On a, it was on a Monday night, and, it, and she was one of our prayer leaders that prays with people at the altar, and she got a word for somebody that I was praying with at the altar. You know, like I was one of the prayer people, and she was one of the prayer people, and she didn't have anybody that she was praying with, and I was praying with the young man, and so she was praying for us, and she felt like the Lord gave her a prophetic word. Well, she didn't walk up and share that with that young man. She shared it with me, but I felt like it was a valid word or whatever else. So then I had her recorded on my phone, and I knew the young man, and so I sent it to them, and it was super encouraging to him. But see, she did that in the right order, rather than just walking up. So don't grow in this and start operating in it, and then start walking around and just walking up to people and sharing it with them. You know what I mean? That's not the way we want it to operate in this church, and that's why it's been under such supervision, you know, from day one, is that we don't want it to... People, because people can get excited about this, and it is so encouraging and all that people can kind of just run with it and get too far out of bounds with it sometimes. We see that. I think that's one of the reasons why it doesn't happen in, in mainline churches too much is because there's, there are some abuses of this. And then, but that's what happens with anything that's of value is it gets counterfeited, right? So, yeah. Steve. Good. So, but when you're, when you're like Nason, you're a team member and you're receiving a word, you've already prayed, you've already covered yeah. yourself in the blood, everything else, so it's not like right. the enemy can come in and do that. You're, you're already like, you've got to... So that, that's, yeah. that covered blocks him. Yeah. He's easy to shut down, not because of us, but because the Lord shuts him down and then we're not having that happen. That, that's correct. However, when all of a sudden out of the blue you get a word, yeah. that's when we have to be very very careful and discerning if we're not already in prayer or if we're not already in a situation where we have the covering of the Holy Spirit the, and and the word just comes I mean I, I just as a brief example um, I know we're running over yeah, if you need to leave to go serve somewhere or go whatever else, yeah, yeah that's fine yeah. slip out but I, I got up one morning, and it was nice and quiet in the house, and I'm just sitting there enjoying the, the quiet and the dark, and I, my mind wasn't thinking about anything in particular. I was just enjoying the solitude, and like that, I got a word, and I went, oh, really? Like, and it, it was about a niece, and it just said she will be pregnant. Now, she's been struggling with infertility, but I'm like, okay, where did that come from? So immediately, Lord, is that you? Lord, is that you? Or is, is that the enemy who wants to maybe distract? And what do I do with it? And, and do I share it? When do I share it? You know, I, you, we go through this process of asking all of these things. If you don't have that covering, yeah, he will. He might try to that's, that's right. But the, but the kind of neat thing was I felt confirmed that, no, this was good, and this was the Lord. And I sent a message to... Um, Alan's sister-in-law, and she says, I can't believe you sent that because she is, 
she is pregnant and she's going to the doctor to um, for her first visit. Well, it turned out it was not a viable pregnancy and she did miscarry. But the Lord had also told me that she would be pregnant by Christmas. I'm like, okay, so now do I share this? Because she's already going through all this pain. and uh, But I did. And then a few months later, or a few weeks later, she was just constantly on my heart again. It's like, Lord, am I supposed to reach out or not reach out? And I waited a week, and he just kept, you know, tugging at me, tugging at me. And finally, I sent a message. I'm like, okay, I just want to let you know that she's on my heart, and I'm praying for her. And she says, I just knew you'd be thinking about her. She is pregnant again, and she has a doctor's appointment tomorrow. and But don't tell anyone. And so she is pregnant, and, and, she, was, and she was pregnant by Christmas, but she didn't know it. It, it, it was, but it was also meant for me to share with them as encouragement because after two years of struggling and so many prayers and so much pain and tears, they just needed to know that God cared so much that he sent a message to me out of the blue. But to what you said is when we get a message like that that's just dropped into our spirit, we have to, have to ask for the spirit's confirmation that it's worth sharing. Because otherwise, can you imagine how painful that would have been? Oh, 